discussion about removal. Uh, normally, either uh, Larry or I would introduce her, but uh, she has worked with uh, Henry for a long time, and since he knows her well, he thought it would be great to have Henry do the, uh, the introduction. So, Henry, Frank. So, so no, I is yours. I am uh, <laughs> deeply honored to have the chance to introduce to you today Sangeeta Shrestova, who. I guess we've been working together for the better part of a decade. Uh, I first met her when she was a graduate student uh, at the Comparative Media Studies program back at MIT, uh, where we did a lot of really interesting work together. And I kind of had a chance to see her in action as a dancer and choreographer. She did a remarkable piece uh, collaboration with Zon Lee and Aspen Funtabacher. Uh, at, uh, around Bollywood there at one of our conferences at MIT that would, still gets referenced when I talk to people who go to the media and transition events. When I first discovered I was going to be moving out here, we, I reached out to Sangeeta, who at that point was finishing up her degree at UCLA, uh, working on the project she's going to be sharing to you some about today. And uh, we've arranged for her to be research director on the civic past group here at uh, USC. And we're working together on a project supported by the MacArthur Foundation looking at youth and political participation. Uh, but what you're going to hear about today is her new book, Just Out. It's all about, is it all about the hips? Uh, <laughs> and I guess we'll find out the answer to that question. And that uh, is not the title of the presentation. <laughs> And, um, she, and I've been very, I was very excited to recently feature that book on my blog. So if you like what you hear today and want to read more about Sankita's work, that's another place to go to dig a little, a little deeper into it. So that said, I'm going to put you into the ca very capable hands of my dear friend and colleague, Sankita. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, a decade. Um, <laughs> I will actually say that the work I am presenting today is it was the culmination of my dissertation at UCLA, but the work on it actually did start at CMS in, at MIT, and I really owe it to Henry in a way because um, while I was definitely exposed to Bollywood films and and I did dance, I never made the connection that Bollywood dance was a valid area of study um, because of the disciplines that I came through. It was quite scorned. And so I really thank you, Henry, uh, for putting me on that path. Because one day we were sitting in a meeting, and Henry just said, you should really look at Bollywood dance. And here we are 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess as professors don't underestimate that one sentence <laughs> that you say to somebody. Um, I'm going to actually, today I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the underlying um, themes in the book, and also around, around Bollywood dance in general. So, for those of you who do know Bollywood dance and Hindi films and all this, bear with me a little bit. I am actually going to back up a little bit and provide a little bit of an overview and an introduction because I feel it's important to, to have that before we actually embark on a more detailed discussion. So for those of you who may not be so familiar with India's films, um, India is, as a country, the largest producers of films in the world. Uh, it produces upward of 900 films a year. Um, just that tells you you cannot absolutely keep up with all the films that come out of <laughs> India. Just that number. Out of that, about one third of those, roughly around 300, are produced by the film industries in what is now Mumbai. It used to be called Bombay. It was renamed in 1995. Um, and there's a really long history of Indian cinema. The first Indian, the first film that was made in Maharashtra, which is the state where Mumbai is in, was called Radha, Raja Haris Chandra. And if you're really interested in the sort of history, there's a brilliant film that's been made about, about that process. And it came out in 1913. And I stress this because people sometimes think of Bollywood, and I will talk about that as a derivative of Hollywood, but it really is an industry that grew up in parallel to Hollywood. Um, with relating to Hollywood in different ways, but I really want to stress that also in terms of international distribution. Well, I'm going to be mostly talking in about the new wave of distribution of Hindi films, which is post 1990s. Uh, there is actually a much earlier distribution of Hindi films, which uh, chronicled the unaligned sort of third world country movement, which India was a part of, which saw the distribution of Hindi films to the former USSR, to Africa, uh, to the Middle East. And if you actually travel to those countries, 
countries as I have done, um, so you know my background, I'm partially Central Eastern European, you will actually encounter that former um, fandom of Hindi cinema in particular, where the stars like uh, Raj Kapoor or Nargis are very well known. So I just I wanted to say that because actually in terms of audiences, the number of people who see Hindi cinema, it might well be the largest industry in the world. So while we cannot talk compare in terms of box office numbers, also because of the very large size of the uh, black market that surrounds this industry uh, and the illegal distribution, uh, it's, it's clear that there are a lot of people who watch the films. Now, what is Bollywood? Bollywood is a term that emerges post-1990s. There's actually been a discussion about where it comes from, and there are some people who claim to have been the first people to have used it. Uh, most likely, it does come from somebody in the UK, in terms of its epistemology. It is clearly a relationship to Hollywood, uh, you know, be Bollywood, Bombay, Hollywood. Not Hollywood, not Los Angeles, I guess, I don't know. For, but it, it, that, that term is there. Uh, and it's also, because of that, it's been a, quite controversial within the industry. Uh, it, because it was, it's kind of seen as a, as a sign that Bollywood is somehow inadequate, uh, that it's an industry that is trying to become Hollywood. Uh, but in the recent, uh, maybe two or three years, there's been a shift as a, in, a sen in a sense of, well, we should just accept this brand and use it. And, and you see that actually being used increasingly. Um, the term, the, and it, Bollywood really cam comes into its own as the non-resident Indian population, that's the di Indian diaspora, and the South Asian diaspora, more broadly speaking, kind of comes of age and becomes a force in the industry and uses the films really to keep in touch with India. So um, prior to digital technologies, those would have been circulated on VCRs. As internet comes into its own, you can actually see a lot of these circulating films online. Um, if you go to a South Asian gathering, most likely there will be some Bollywood songs being played. But it also coincides with economic reform within India, which allows a more open distribution of the films internationally and also changes the financial structure of the films. Um, but more importantly, Bollywood, as um, some of the scholars who've written about this have said, is really a moment where the, the sort of the loose narrative, which I will be talking about, becomes codified as a Bollywood-style narrative. And I mentioned the digital media already. So, what is what are Bollywood or Hindi film narratives? Uh, it's important to stress that they draw on various sources, ranging from Indian traditional theater all the way through to Hollywood. It's by definition a hybrid style. But what's, what's become clear about it is that it's really a cinema of interruptions. And this is really important if you're ever going to sit down and watch a Bollywood film in terms of how you set up your expectations for how the narrative is going to flow. I've encountered this countless times where people sit down and they expect a sort of ABC kind of structure that they're used to from Hollywood, and it just doesn't follow that. You might not get to the main point of the plot until about 40 minutes because it's, you know, there's, it's, a, it's an epic. It's unfolding over various, various, um, on various levels. Uh, I cannot go into too many details, but the important thing is that these these non-linear linear narratives have interruptions which which kind of operate on a level that may or may not be related to the main plot. Um, and here the significance of song and dance comes in because song and dance is really one of the mechanisms of interruption. It's a way to enhance the emotion, it's a way to move the story forward, but it's also a way to, um, if you've heard the term item dance, uh, item dances are films that are often, I mean dances that are often quite sexual in content, and you'll sometimes see stars that are, they never reappear, they're not even, they're not related to the plot, you'll never see them come back, but it's just a dance that interrupts the plot and kind of lets you take a break from, let's say, the tension that's happening uh, in the film. So, I'm going to attempt to do the impossible, given the large volume <laughs> of films that are produced in India, and if you think about five to six dances per film, uh, it's really quite impossible. I'm going to try and introduce you to the history of Hindi film dance, and I do this with a real, me an intention, because I want you to understand the diversity <coughs> and the various influences that have shaped Hindi film dance over the decades. Um, unfortunately, there are very few, uh, few document. There's very few existing films from the early 1900s. So what I'm actually going to do is show you a five-minute um, cut together, little sequence. That will give you a little overview of what Hindi film dance looks like. The first, uh, so I'm just going to briefly tell you what film you're looking at, and then you'll just kind of 
get a flavor. Now, of course, for the every, film, every clip I chose, you could have chosen 100 others. The first clip I'm going to show is actually not a Hindi film. It's a Bengali film, but it's one of the earlier films that survived. And it's, it's from Chandra Leka from 1948. Uh, it's, a, it's called The Famous Drum Dance. That's how it's referred to right now. But you'll see the influence of classical Indian dance in this one. And it was a festival party. Yeah, maybe you can turn off the light. It was so a little bit. Okay, so this is a 1955 film um, featuring two famous classical dancers who actually migrated into the film industry. And here you see them falling out of their role as Radha Krishna and actually expressing their own love, which becomes significant for the, for the story later on. They forget to dance. <laughs> And now, this is a 1956 film, uh, actually early 1960s, my apologies. Um, this is Shami Kapoor, I don't know if he recently passed away, actually he's considered, interestingly he's considered one of the first heroes to have really danced. Um, in his own assessment, he did open a dance school later on in his life, he didn't take a single dance class ever. Um, and here he's featured with, two, I love this clip because it really gives you a quick introduction. So you have the hero dancing, and then you'll see Helen, who is uh, one of the famous vamps. So as I was talking about the item dance number and the sort of sexual content of, of Hindi film dance, she's one of the, she's, she was known as one of the, she's by far the most famous vamp. And then you'll see a heroine who's drawing much more on classical dance movement. And you can also see, start to see the change in the movement. So that's Helen. That's uh, my gentleman. And they're actually involved in a dance composition. Actually, early 1980s film, but I'm putting it more into the 1970s section. This is entering of Amitabh Bachchan, who's known as the angry young man. Uh, and here, it's really important to also think about the way that Hindi cinema was relating to the um, the Indian society. And and in the 1970s, there was really a sense of disillusionment about what the promises of a modern Indian state. And, it, and Namita Bachchan really came up as a star, and he's by far most likely the, yes, he's still the largest star we have. And he he really stood in for the sort of frustration and the angry young man. Um, he danced, his dancing skills were also not necessarily um, the most trained, but he was very important in terms of how, about in terms of allowing men to move in particular <laughs> a 1970s film featuring a, very, a recurring theme in a theme in Hindi cinema and Hindi film dance that I'm going to talk about, which is the courtesan. The courtesan and her dance. Her dance is tragedy, in effect, because she is a woman who's destined to dance, but she's also destined to live on the outskirts of society because of her dance and because of her relationship to, to sexual sexuality. So this is a very famous dance, Pakiza, uh, from Pakiza. And what's significant about this is actually um, just a little anecdote. I mean, I don't know, these are just little stories. But by the time she was actually dying, the actual actress was dying of alcoholism as this film was being made, and her liver actually did give out. And by the time the film was released, she had passed away. So it became this really important historical film that just is often referenced in the history. So the courtesan is entertaining a client. Clients. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, um, like the 1980s 
we really, uh, there's always been an influence of Hollywood in, in Indian cinema, but with the 1980s, there was really a sense of, we need to break away from the tradition. And so this, this film, uh, a brazen film about a young disco dancer, uh, came out and has become kind of a, a signature remembered dance movement that really that broke away from that. Um, interestingly, also, I don't know if you, if you want to watch it very carefully, we restaged this in London two years ago when we discovered that actually the edits are not on beat, uh, which was quite interesting in terms of, you probably wouldn't get away with that today. But. I'm a disco dancer. I am a disco dancer. I am a disco dancer. into the 1990s, where we really have this change in the industry, an outward-facing industry, and India that's starting to gear up to think about its global identity in terms of the, uh, globalization, uh, in terms of globalization. And we have a film in 1997, which to me really encapsulates this. It was Build a Pagal Hai. And you, just looking at the dancers, I just want you to note how the dancers look, how they move, how the configurations look in comparison what you, to what you've seen before. Choreographer uh, Shamak Dewar, who I'll be speaking about later, uh, was trained in London, and he brought back a style. And he actually does jazz. I mean, jazz and jazz, jazz dance. And he was asked to come into this film. Now, today, uh, let's say, how many years is it? 15 years after this film was released, he now runs a dance school empire in India. I mean, it's by far the largest school. It has. He has. It only in Mumbai he runs schools in 12 locations. Um, and across, and now he's actually he's planning to open a school in LA. He's already in Vancouver. He's in the Middle East. He has a school in Australia. Um, so just to give you a sense of also the business potential of this and how he's been able to translate his entry into cinema into a very effective business model. Now the last three clips which I'm going to show you are really just the last uh, last decade of. Uh, Again, impossible to summarize in, in three clips, but the last decade of Bollywood dance, or Hindi film dance, which is really just showing you the diversity. Here we have um, two heroines, uh, two protagonists, actually one a courtesan that I was talking about before, and the other a <coughs> upper class married woman um, dancing together, moving in the same way. So you've really seen a collapse in terms of the segregation of who can move in what way. Um, the next clip that, I'm, that you're going to see is uh, Ritik Roshan, who's actually in, in Kites, and that you'll see a lot of influence of hip-hop, Western dance. Actually, the whole film, that whole film, the second clip, is based in Las Vegas. And the third uh, clip that you're going to see is actually a tribute to the drum dance that we started with from 1948. So I'm just going to let those play through.
I actually had the we'll watch it all again. <laughs> I actually had the privilege of um, of speaking to the choreographers, of several of the choreographers. And in particular, the last one is very interesting, Rekha and Chini Prakash, because they actually talked to me about the self-reflexivity that they now have, where they can look back over the last few hundred years of choreography for Hindi cinema and think about a body of work, or what is what does it mean to be talking about Hindi cinema and Hindi film dance, which is something, in speaking to some of the other choreographers, they don't think like that. I, it sounds really odd to say that, but they really think about the need at hand in terms of choreography the dance to make it uh, to make it fit into the narrative um, just returning to so just the, turning to my presentation here and sort of just to summarize so what can we say about Hindi film dance it's incredibly diverse in terms of the movements that it draws on it draws from a great on a range of Indian dances to Hollywood to other styles um, but to but to me, what's important to think about it is the function that it plays above the sort of narrative and immediate movement context, which is what uh, Madhu Prasad has really eloquently, I think, called a space of temporary permission that allows for borrowing from different movement contexts. Um, and in a way that actually has not been allowed in other, in other element, aspects of Indian society, I feel. So, um, but with the market considerations now coming into play, the question is how is that sort of freedom changing? Um, and I will talk about that as I move on. Now the market considerations actually play into what I'm going to introduce now, which is live Hollywood dance. So, so far we've really been talking only about dancers in the films themselves. But what I was really looking at in my research was live Bollywood dance, which is, as the pictures here suggest, fandom or dancers all around the world performing dances in Hindi films. So performing them live, reinterpreting them. Um, this really coincides with the 1990s emergence of brand Bollywood. And it's, it's really, to me at least, and maybe this is an um, ode to Henry in some ways, but it's, it's really fandom and performance. Uh, but just like fandom in general uh, is cr sometimes critical of the source material, it's quite an active fandom where there's an active consideration of what to include, what to exclude, what to add in, what, how to position it. And that's where it, what really becomes interesting to me is, is this, this sort of negotiation of the film versus the live performance. Um, what we're seeing now, though, in terms of the current trends, and I'll return to those in the end, is a increasing professionalization of both the, the the dances in the films, which are becoming technically more and more difficult, but also the live performance sphere, where there are now reality dance shows. There are actual schools dedicated to teaching Bollywood dance. There are performances, there are tours, there are, there's the Bollywood um, Bombay Dreams musical, which was staged in London and later brought to um, later brought to New York. So we really see a kind of two, two trends right now. There's a participatory culture, which has evolved, developed around the films and the dances, and now there's a professionalization of that sphere that's going on at the same time. So, as I said, I'm really interested in the symbiotic, what I call a symbiotic relationship between film dance as a, as a, tr as a practice and a genre that has grown from by sucking in different movement styles and changing them, and live performance as Bollywood dance. And to me, coming out of dance, uh, a dance practice, what I was really interested in is how choreography functions as a mechanism in the interpreting between the two. And just to give you, I know that many of you do not, are not necessarily thinking about choreography all the time, um, I just wanted to give you a quick sense of how this <coughs> adjustment can happen Now we can start to get quite specific about what we mean uh, by showing you one more clip. And this clip is actually, Henry, you've seen this one before, but it's been really effective, so I've kept it in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a, it shows you four instances of the same dance being performed in different contexts. What you're going to see on the lower lower side here, on the, I guess my our right, is the actual original Doom to um, song sequence, and then you're going to see various interpretations of it, taken actually from YouTube in this, for this purpose. I'm 
What have they taken out? What maybe couldn't they accept in terms of the movement? Um, in terms of the signature move, right? Which we might get to practice. <laughs> what does that mean? How does it identify them with the, or actually signify that they identify with the original uh, film dance, right? Um, also, the dancers in the, the clip, like in the original clip, I actually had the opportunity to, to meet and spend time with all of them. Um, what, what do they look like? How do they look in relationship to the women who are dancing and the men in the different clips? So there's a lot that can be talked about in terms of the choreography. Um, so that kind of sets up my, my method. In terms of the actual research that I did for, for the dissertation, I was really interested in understanding how Bollywood dance plays out locally. What does it mean? So in this, in this context of choreography, how do we really, can we turn on the light again? I feel like everyone will be very cool. <laughs> Thank you, Raya. Um, so what I did is I actually decided to do a multi-locational ethnography of Bollywood dance. In each one of the cities, um, Prague is in parentheses because it played out a little differently, I decided, I went and I entered th through a Bollywood dance school where I spent time, and that was the initial end point of entry, where I observed the dances. I didn't have a chance to neatly videotape them and sync them up in the same way that I got to do here, but I, in effect, did the same process. I would look at the what they were dancing, how they had changed it. I would then interview the choreographer and the dancers to understand if there were some movements that they had to change because they were inappropriate in any way, um, how they saw their dance figuring into, in the local community. And then because I had um, the privilege of some extensive time, <laughs> in a way, I got to return to the location, which was a great privilege, and then spend time understanding how that plays out in the broader community. So in Mumbai, I entered through Shamak Dabur's school, which is the, who's the choreographer that you saw with the white women, the white, they were not white women, women in white. Um, dancing. I entered through his school, so I got to observe his classes, but then I also went on to Bollywood dance set, spent time at the, the, the dancers' union, um, interviewed lots of dancers there. In Los Angeles, I entered through Knuckle Dave Mahajan School, who's the choreographer who's been choreographing the So You Think You Can Dance Bollywood entries that you may have seen um, that I've also briefly touched upon. And then um, in Kathmandu, I entered through a, a, another school, a dance school, and then really in a way, because I had a lot of um, past interest in Nepal uh, and past experience, I was able to really push out to understand how the dance was situated on top of a Nepali society um, in more generally speaking. In Prague, I didn't actually enter through a school because um, I'm too embedded in that, uh, too <laughs> in that Bollywood dance reality as one of the founders of the Indian Film Festival there, so the, re the research played out a little differently. So what I'm actually going, I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a quick flavor of each city. Now there's an incredible diversity, and I would if you're really interested in what's going on in these cities in terms of Bollywood dance, I would encourage you to look at the book. But just to give you something to walk away with in terms of thinking about it, I'm going to provide a really quick overview. So in Mumbai, there's really a, a, a joining of a new body image, a sort of global, lean, athletic body image and the way Bollywood dance functions. And uh, how better to express it than in the words of some of some of the people who are actually participating in the industry. This is one of the dancers in Shamak Dabur school. Um, and he's talking about the linear progression that you kind of got to see and he's giving his point of view on how Bollywood dance has changed. In the 50s, they used to move their neck and eyes in the films. In the 60s and 70s, they used small lyrical movements in their hands, and maybe they were sitting in a garden. In the 19, 1980s came that whole disco dancer thing. But people were not glamorous. They were not chic. 
Um, the major change came after Dilto Pagal Head. For the first time, Shamak used professional dancers. They were good looking, they had life. I was in the theater when that movie came out and people were shocked at the change. Even my mother was shocked. Um, another dancer said earlier, it was, the, it was more the actors and a lot of dancers. They had not correct bodies, unfit bodies. Shamak came in and brought perfect bodies and nobody wanted those imperfect bodies anymore. Now Bollywood dance is more about class. <laughs> now the dancers look just as good as the hero and the heroine, if not better. Better Background dancers today are more like models and very highly paid. So this is the sort of aspirational space of, of Bollywood dance in Mumbai. Um, and before I actually talk about an actual instance in my field work, I actually want to uh, provide a commentary from one of the film directors who was reflecting on the trends in the industry more broadly and relates very nicely to this discussion of the body. Um, anyone who doesn't follow the West in the industry is going to be gone. For many people in the business, their pride won't let them follow the West, but following the West is not surrendering. Following the West, the best of the West, is following originality. Western innovation is superior, and I think we're just beginning to understand that. With my films, I'm targeting the urban multiplexes, the sophisticated, media-savvy young crowd. Frankly, I couldn't give a f a for the, about the villages. <coughs> so this is Ram Gopal Verma, if any of you are curious. I mean, it's an extreme statement of the situation, but in my understanding, it really is that, that there is this sense of Bollywood dance is really this contemporary, global-looking space, right? So, but I'm just wondering, when I was on the set of the film Race, I really got to see this play out in the daily lives of the dancers. So I arrived on the set, and I got to go to the dressing room where the dancers were getting ready. And it was like there were borders in the dressing room. So there, was, there were Russian dancers there, who were a great proclivity to use foreign dancers, and there's always been there, that's much more exact, it's becoming more and more um, exaggerated now as there's also more financial means to bring the dancers in, who were in one corner. And then there were sort of the frontline dancers who looked very much like the Shabak Dabar kind of dancers who have BAs and master's degrees and, and have chosen this way of life. And then there were the background dancers who were generally from very working class backgrounds, um, often didn't speak English, had not taken a dance class, and knew that they would never move to the front rows. And so what's really happening now is this is this tension where these sort of diva dancers, <laughs> their <laughs> Shamak Dabar style, are coming in and reshaping the industry, which is causing its own pressures on the on the actual um, on the actual industry itself and the dancers who've been with it for a long time. Um, what this what this means is that there's a real need for those dancers to learn movements, and they're definitely not trying to pick up Indian classical dance when they when they try to pick up dance moves. A lot of them don't even have time, and they practice with the television. But that's what they're practicing is the sort of rhythmic Russian hip hop style movements. And it's I'm, I'm giving you a sort of black and white quick overview, but I would actually argue from my perspective, from what I saw, that it's largely true. And there's there'll be certain instances like the Madhuri Dixit or the, the that dance which uses classical dance movements, but those are not as common, and they're not they're not why people would go to a Bollywood dance class in those cities. All the way to all. 10, 12 time zones away, Los Angeles. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to read <laughs> a, a little introduction to the So You Think You Can Dance competition. I could paraphrase it, but I feel like I actually read it better when I have time to think about it. Um, we have a context here where, you know how they draw the dance styles they have to do out of a hat? This is, I think, the first season. Katie, Katie and Joshua, the dance contestants, have picked a new dance style from the hat, we are told and they felt a little confused. The show cuts back to that moment when Katie, a young Japanese-American woman, reads un uncertainly from a card. It's something called Bollywood. Her tone is perplexed. To clarify matters, we cut to choreographers Nakul and Marla, who tell us that Bollywood is a dance style that originated in India. Then we witness them rehearsing for it. We return now to the show, where Katie and Joshua take center stage ready to present their dance. Dressed in a glittering midriff-bearing costume, Katie waves a transparent shawl as he, she circles her dance partner. With great care, Joshua moves through the staccato movement that in, movements that introduce their vigorous Bollywood dance, sets, dance set to a 2000 year, 2000 film, 2007 film. Over the next few minutes, they cavort with flirtatious gestures and expressions, leaping to the cat song's catchy beat and punctuating it with very precise Indian classical gestures. As, as Joshua sweeps Katie off her feet into the into the final visually impressive pose, uh, which is right there, 
Nigel Lithgow exclaims, who would have ever dreamt that we would be seeing Indian cultural dancing on this program? <laughs> so, and Nakul Dev Mahajan, there's a cut to the choreographer and he's smiling and he's extremely happy. So, just to provide the tension, I mean, in, in Los Angeles, Bollywood dance stands in for India. I mean, it, it does, in, in the logic of two things. One is the nostalgia of the diaspora, wanting to keep in touch with India and wanting, needing Bollywood dance to be Indian. But there's also, with Bollywood dance kind of getting uh, some entry into Hollywood, there's a need to have it function in a particular, I think, orientalized way, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, to have it really be quintessentially Indian, timeless. Um, or the other option is hitch, a sort of slight, uh, slightly condescending way of thinking about, oh, this it's kind of funny, it's quite imperfect. You know, if you think about how you laughed about the disco dancer, that kind of like, oh, it's, it's quite endearingly not quite tastefully done. Kind of, and I call it, in my book, I call it unintentional kitsch. Um, so it's a very different, but it's very different from what's happening in Mumbai, right? Where you actually see them pulling against each other. And I've really seen this play out in particular songs where in India they would be choreographed with sort of the latest hip hop movement. And in Los Angeles they'd be re-choreographed completely um, with Indian classical dance movements. So, and there's, there's a real tension right now going on there. Um, I'm briefly going to actually talk more briefly, I'm running out of time, I'm going to more briefly touch on Kathmandu and, and Prague because those situations are actually quite complex. Um, in Kathmandu, Bollywood dance actually latches onto a much longer history and a dependency on India uh, and a cultural sort of in, inadequacy. <laughs> and just to kind of give you a sense of how that is, when I was in, in Kathmandu, there was Hrithik Roshan, who I showed many clips of, is a very famous actor, and many of the young male dancers who came to the school where I was at really wanted to dance like him. And this was interesting to me because a few years earlier there had been an incident where Ritik Roshan had allegedly said something like, I don't like Nepalis. You know, it was never proved that he'd said that. Um, but people died in Nepal. Indian businesses were attacked. Um, dance, his, uh, his movies were banned for almost a year. And this, and a, a couple of years later, I come in and he's back to being the, the star. So it's kind of this love-hate relationship. It actually plays out often, sometimes in very violent ways. I actually talk about a suicide that happened in Nepal around Bollywood dance and the Bollywood dancer who was seen as having compromised her reputation. In Prague, what happens, it, kind of relating to the LA orientalization kind of, um, that I was talking about. In Prague, what we see is a latching on, a kind of interesting continuity between the earlier distribution of Hindi cinema that I was talking about and a new um, fascination with the Orient. Um, and this really, as you can see in the costumes here, these are all Czech dancers. So what's interesting about Prague and why I was really interested in studying it is that it's a location where there's very few Indians uh, or Indian diasporic communities. So the, the Bollywood dance culture is really driven by locals. By, by Czechs. And I actually had the opportunity to recently work on a show there, and what was interesting about that was that we had these dancers, actually some of the dancers here, um, in the show, and we had some Indian dancers who came in as well from India. And what they wanted to perform, and what these dancers wanted them to perform, completely different. It was like, it was night and day. They'd be like, let's make this really like hip and nightlife kind of savvy, cool club dance. They're like, no, 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 we want to wear her sari and we want to look up very demurely. And, and no, we don't want to do it like that. So it was really an interesting kind of push and like back and forth experience uh, in terms of really experiencing that, that di those conflicting definitions. So how do we start to connect the different sites? I mean, I, I feel like in a way, the big contribution is already having these sites across a fixed period of time because we really start to see um, the symbiotic relationship between film and performance and how it plays out in what I'm calling still a participatory culture of Bollywood dance. But really to me, I wanted to bring into discussion the importance of choreography and agency in this space in terms of how the dancers are negotiating these spaces. And I say this because I was really speaking to an audience of um, Indian classical dancers and scholars who have been quite dismissive of what they call mimicry, uh, even in the post-colonial sense of the word. And I really wanted to talk more about appropriation and different 
senses of agency, but at the same time recognizing the importance of the circulating image. I didn't want to get rosy, I, you know, wear rose-colored glasses about the agency that the dancers have without recognizing the actual power, but limited power, that the film that globally circulates has. So what's really interesting to me is the contrast between the global flow and the local meanings. Um, which really comes out with a di conflicted definition of Bollywood dance. But what I'm seeing now in terms of the work that I'm doing is a slippage. You can't clearly dis separate local and global. It just doesn't, that doesn't work anymore because the dancers are physically traveling, but the question is who gets to travel. Um, in particular, now I'm looking at online spaces where I see there's a big controversy around YouTube where actually the Hindi film industry has now taken to removing what they see as copyright violations of dances that are choreographed to Hindi film songs that are uploaded. Um, and they're actually taking those down and allowing only the official song and dance sequence to live up there. So I actually have several block sequences right now. And that's actually causing, thinking back to Kevin's LLRG, uh, Living Room Rock Gods example, an interesting tension where the participatory culture as it would exist on, on YouTube is being actually stopped by the copyright process. And so, so I'm kind of still continuing to think about what that means. And I kind of feel that there is down the road sometime soon going to be an interesting negotiation that has to happen between the industry and the participatory culture that has evolved around Bollywood dance. And here I, I think about some of the examples of fan activism that we've talked about in Henry's context. And this is how I'm starting to try to think to connect this to the work that we've done together. And just in terms of how I'm thinking about the research now, I'm no longer able to travel the world and go to different <laughs> ethnographic sites. So what I've actually just launched, well, it's not officially launched yet, but is a mapping project, um, just using Google Maps, where I have, um, just to show you, I have actually plotted different Bollywood dance schools that I could find, and I've asked them to post their story on there. So. And I can't load it up right now, but I can easily share it with people if they're interested. So now I have done US, Australia, UK, um, and I'm working on India, so they can actually post. Of course, that comes up, comes up with questions of who can post and who cannot, because like my, my site in Nepal, none of most of those dancers are not online at all. So it's an interesting question of how that global flow may actually not apply to some of the dancers that I work that I looked at in my analysis. So that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. <laughs> Time for some questions. Alana. Alana. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious if you see any um, uh, dance and film pack packaging itself for an international or Western audience. So I think there was one example where there's in your latter day films where you saw more like westernized traditional kinds of dances. But um, and I wonder if if there seems to be like a high culture that's for like the festival circuit or or something that that packages it more for a global Western or Indian audience. Yeah, so I'm speaking really about a subset of, of even films made within the industry in Mumbai. So yeah. Bollywood is a very specific subset of that, right? So there's definitely art films and there's all this other cinema that's happening that's specifically for the festival circuit. But just to answer your questions, yes, there are films that are certainly made for the diaspora. And they often you know, are very glamorous portrayals of what it means to be in the diaspora, literally living in castles in the United Kingdom. And, you know, having these, but having an Indian heart, right? And returning to India when time comes to find a good wife. I mean, that's very simplified, and now those portrayals are actually becoming more and more complex. Um, I actually, I have great hope for the industry, because I feel like, you know, I don't know if you, some of you heard about My Name is Khan, which was a fairly recent film, which actually was situated here, but really tried to take on Muslim American identity in the United States, but also was it coming out for a Muslim American, a Muslim actor in India as Muslim. So, you know, there's a lot, there's actually edgy material being done as well, and that relates to Bollywood dance too. Uh, here I was just speaking about mainstream sort of trends, and there's certainly lots of tendrils running on in various directions. Yeah. Thank you for a great presentation. It's very fascinating. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk more about the costumes, and uh, did you notice any differences in the costume between the live performance and the film, and especially how that relates to sexuality, because uh, I lived in Hyderabad for two years, so what I was most shocked about in relation to Bollywood film and dance was how different the costumes were, and including the movements and everything, but especially the costumes from 
the way that women are expected to dress dress in public. So is that different for live performance? I think it depends where you are. So what I saw, I mean, certainly there's, well, there's also the cost of the costume. So some of the costumes, like in Dola Re Dola, the, the two here, heroines in the latter f a section of the film, those, those costumes cost thousands of dollars. So for live performers, they actually are also struggling to kind of keep up with the glamour of it. So that's one piece of it is actually the cost. But in terms of um, in terms of what's covered and what's not, it's, it's really played out very interestingly in LA, where I really saw a redressing of the of the dancers. So they would, you know, in the film they would be wearing a mini skirt and a little tank top, and then on the stage, and Knuckle would be like, no, no, we can't do that. We're going to wear, you know, the Indian kind of linga sari setup. That's what we're going to do about this. So it, there's been that. But also on the sets in India, it was really interesting. The Russian dancers, they were very quite open about the fact that they are asked to show more skin than any of the other dancers, and the dance and the costumes for the foreign foreign dancers. Um, which I almost had to wear. <laughs> I was like, no, I can't do that because it was just really, it was very, very skimpy. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. I had a question. You made, you made a really interesting comment about the Western audience being perplexed by the just sort of tempo of the narrative in the films. And I wondered if any of your informants had the opposite experience of, the, of movies like Step Up, where the, the, the dances have to be like tightly woven into the narrative and they aren't allowed to be just interruptions the way you describe it. So I actually, my interviews were prior to the wave of dance films sort of being really, you know, high, like step up one, two, three, maybe one had come out. Um, they were more focused on MTV clips. They didn't actually talk about, you know, they watched a lot of MTV. They didn't necessarily watch dance films from Hollywood. So, um, there was just a sense of like this is how we do it, and and you know and, and they would even say like you know in in Hollywood films they would always dance like they might dance in the character but then Busby Berkeley didn't. They were quite aware of the differences. They were quite articulate about that. They they and they knew how to watch Hollywood films clearly. So <laughs> yeah. I'm if you looked at sort of videos that are posted that are kind of derivatives of derivatives of Hollywood film, and the example I'm thinking of is work for Disney and there was this uh, Cheetah Girls is this franchise mm -hmm. and they did like the Bollywood mm -hmm. version so then you would have kids posting on YouTube the video versions of that version of Bollywood which was itself a version of Bollywood <laughs> based on right um, but that but would that still be part I guess of, of the YouTube culture of Bollywood but it's really a YouTube fandom of Disney's version of Bollywood right so that gets into an interesting space I didn't look at that but it's a it because all the instances that I talked about are united by the song, right? They're all drawing on songs from Hindi films. But in the case of the Cheetah Girls or from the MIA video of Mia, um, they're they're starting that's starting to move in a different direction. So I, I'm not sure if there would be part of that sort of fandom or not. I, I'm not. I didn't look at it, so I can't really make a. It, I guess the dancers wouldn't see it that way because that's not how they would search for it. They would search for it under the song, under a particular song. Yeah, you mentioned shortly the role of new media, and um, I'm curious, so I don't know in what years most of your film was done, but in what way you see, um, in addition to uploading movies to you, play the clips to YouTube, um, when you talk about maybe there being a global fan culture, in what way um, you know people around the world are you know interacting with each, with each other around this, so not only in our local communities, but also um, cross, you know, cross communities, and if so, you know, is, is this, in, in what way is, is are the things that you observe new, or are, are the things that have been there before? You know, as long as there have you know not as long, but you know, so I, I ago. really I really saw new media playing out a lot in the United States. Uh, where there's there's an established culture of dance competitions and hosting of those and intercollegiate competitions kind of um, somewhere between varsity sport and cultural show and and so there's a lot of new, um, new media activity around there around exchanging movements around highlighting different dancers I wouldn't aside from the sort of competitive element to it which was quite interesting I don't think I saw much interesting new media use in the context of Nepal it's its absence right I mean yeah. if you don't have electricity it's a little hard to be dialing up to watch YouTube videos. So that was that was something. Um, but in Mumbai, it was actually cell phones, so mobile phones, um, where I even saw instances where choreographers would, you know, text their, there was a way, they had a way of actually texting 
the choreography to their assistants. Like, you know, they had actually a lingo for doing that, which was quite interesting. So they, they were, so that was, that would be an interesting new media to use. Yeah. Where did the uh, title for your book come from? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kept on being asked that. It, it, in, in the classical, so in a classical Indian dance, uh -huh. which I was in some ways speaking to when I was writing this, uh, there is a taking out of the hips because there was a big, uh, big trend to make Indian dance less lascivious, more spiritual, and it was seen as you know the hips as being symbolic about that. And um, and in the public imagination, Bollywood dance became the other side of that. It became the, the the place where the hips went when they got taken out of Indian classical dance. <laughs> <So, laughs> and and you'll see that you know, actually it's beautiful if you actually look at it in you know, a classical Indian dance concert, it'll be like, it almost looks like, to me, like arith arithmetic gymnastics, you know, you might not even see hips, like they're like, I mean, very precise, very clean, and then when they dance for Bollywood, they'll just kind of start to move the hips a little bit more, so in a way, it was a provocation to the Indian classical dancers. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Lori? Um, when you were talking about the different people learning dance in India, you said that they don't, they're not interested in Indian classical dance. That made me interested. Is, it, is there any movement at all that thinks like a high culture, like that's an important part of like history, and that that should be valued and upheld? And oh, it's incredibly. I mean, it's it's very. It's, this is I'm talking about interest, so popular mm -hmm. interest in schools. That's what you would learn, right? Uh, if, if they would bring in, it's actually been institutionalized into schools. So it's like, like rebellious and not. Do that. It's a little bit rebellious. Um, yeah. But the thing that surprised me about uh, film in in India when we were there was that there seemed to be a cinema a cinema on every corner and there seemed to be lines around the cinema starting at one in the afternoon and lasting late into the night and it was a really really central part of the culture. People were always talking about the latest films and it, it seems like it, I'd never seen a, a society that was as dominated by film as mm -hmm. India was. Yeah, and it's a, I mean, Ritesh can maybe even speak smiling and nodding, <laughs> making interesting <laughs> noises. <laughs> but there's a different culture of movie going as well, uh, and it's it's really an, an event of different sorts. You don't necessarily go into the theater to be silent, um, and you don't necessarily go in there for the whole movie either. So, but, but that really, when we started the Prague Bo Bollywood Festival, that was something that we really struggled with because there was a big misunderstanding about how to behave in the theater, where the Czech audiences would want people to be silent, and the Indians who were there were there because they were there to watch films the way they were used to, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and so it was a lot of educating audiences on both ends in terms of what was going on. So that's certainly true. I mean, in, in terms of, I would, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion without whether Indian cinema is India's popular culture in some ways. I mean, you know, there's certainly other tendrils of popular culture in India, but this is the most visible and dominant one. I mean, just to give an example, when Amitabh Bachchan, the, one of the actors that I showed, one of the older ones, he got hurt on sets, is a famous story, um, and he ended up collapsing, and, you know, the country stopped. I mean, it stopped. Business is closed. You know, flights were almost canceled. Um, the prime minister at the time canceled his tour, came back to India, went to the hospital to see him. It was, I mean, it was, it was like, this, this is it. This is the most important thing that we have going in this country. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why the negotiations also around what Bollywood is, is and how it, how it shows India, what kind of light it's showing India in. Um, and that really surfaced around Slumdog Millionaire in 2008, when you know it was suddenly like, yes, this is the visibility we've always wanted, not with this film. This is not the India we wanted to show to the world. And now this is the, the sort of glamorization of poverty as it was criticized. It's like this is not what we wanted the world to see. So, but ironically, that's the film. That's the only film that's won an, an Indian film that's won an Oscar. <coughs> yeah, this. I came in a bit late, so sorry if you've already covered this, but I was wondering about. Um, whether what you think about the use of remixed music to propagate dance to audiences that would not normally appropriate uh, appropriate Bollywood dance or think about uh, you know joining a school. So the example that comes to mind is the uh, Pussycat Dolls version of Jago, mm -hmm. which was a big hit on YouTube. Or even way back before YouTube, there was an indie pop song, Kalyu Kachaman, which was mixed here uh, with, to, 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 to great success with the, with the famous rap track, I forget which one it was. So if, if the music is more globally packaged, do you think that will encourage or uh, make more people want to 
you don't have to dance because of that. I mean, you could also look at Zumba, right? Zumba is, has quite a few Bollywood songs actually in its mix. So I'm not. I, I'm not sure about how to answer that. I mean, I see now you actually see the remixes within Bollywood films themselves, right? right? So they're actually remixing them even yeah. just the There is no original in some right. cases. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that's so why they encourage more Bollywood dance or not. I, it certainly seems to be like even in the Zumba example, it's encouraging some sort of watered down version of whirling your wrists or at least something, you know, that looks in a weird, in some way, Indian, you know, so. But it's good, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, but that, in a way, my argument back to people who say, oh, that's such a watered down version of Indian culture is that Bollywood's has always been about that. It's always been about mixing, and it's always been about a watered down version of something, so. <laughs> yeah. Our, uh, our speakers next week are our own Wally Bear and Francois Barr, and they're speaking on the topic of do mobile apps promote more mobile openness? So I hope you'll come and join us for their talk. And uh, Sangeeta, thank you for a thank very, you. very, very <laughs>